has a relativistic tendency uh, to running into postmodernist approaches. Um, postmodernism is, may well have a kind of relativistic leaning, um, maybe in anthropological or sociological discussions you run into cultural relativism. I think you're going to run into relativistic thinking more obviously than you are into skeptical um, approaches. Uh, so for that reason, I, I think it's something that has a kind of a relevance outside of epistemologists or perhaps a broader interest. Um, and it may be that you'll run into people or in your own thinking you might be inclined towards relativism because you think independently uh, it's a good thing to be um, sort of tolerant to other cultures, people with other religions and so forth and relativism can sometimes um, seem to be a way of justifying or, or providing a rationale for tolerance. Now, what to say about relativism. Well, the first, the first thing to say about it is that there, in a sense, isn't any such thing as relativism simply construed. There is no single doctrine that constitutes relativism. There are a number of different relativistic stances or positions. You could be a relativist about morality or about uh, judgments to do with the value of works of art, aesthetic relativism. Uh, you could be a relativist about truth, about what exists, reality, the world. It could be a relativist, and this is most relevant to us, about knowledge or about justification, but also about correct con uh, concepts and, and the way in which language relates to reality and so forth. Of most relevance are going to be those forms of relativism that you might call epistemic or epistemological relativism. That's relativism about knowledge or about justified belief. So that's what I'll be focusing on uh, in the beginning. Towards the end of the lecture, I'll talk about Popper, who has a slightly different take on relativism, who seems to be talking about something a little bit to do with um, not just epistemic relativism, but also um, a kind of a conceptual um, uh, relativist position as well. Now, any relativist claim is going to be making a claim about um, something depending on and varying with respect to something. Right, so a, something is relative to something, and what's the what is it that's relative, and what is it relative to? Um, on the first, I guess it's on the left-hand side of the relative, or the thing that um, that is relative to something, you're going to find knowledge or morality or rationality, um, justification. And on the side of that to which these things are relative, you're going to find something like culture, typically culture, um, or language, could be a language, uh, could be a particular theory or a viewpoint. In the philosophy of science, there's what's known as paradigms. These are big theoretical frameworks. Um, claims could be relative to paradigms. Um, so as a result of a claim that knowledge or morality is relative to language or culture, you get the claim that knowledge um, is relative to this thing that changes. Um, what follows from a relativist claim? Well, a relativist about truth or knowledge and so forth is going to say, look, there's no absolute truth. There's no sort of absolute uh, fact about what it is to be justified about something. There's no um, uh, morality in some sense that uh, sort of objective facts about morality that apply independently of particular cultures. Um, when you're a relativist, you're just going to say that knowledge, what's taken to be knowledge, the way the world is, rationality, morality, and so forth, is something that de simply depends upon a particular context. And the context is going to be whatever culture you actually happen to inhabit or whatever local um, framework you're operating in. So there's, the idea is going to be that if it's knowledge that we're thinking about, there's no such thing as knowledge in any sort of objective or absolute sense. There's just whatever members of a particular culture happen to take to be knowledge. And the relativist is going to deny that there's any sort of extra-cultural or 
framework independent or context independent or objective uh, viewpoint from which you could say that what's taken to be knowledge in a, in a particular culture really is, right? All there is to it is what people actually take to be knowledge or morality or rational. So what this kind of stance goes for or asserts is that with respect to such a thing, something like knowledge or justified belief, there is nothing universal. There is nothing absolute. Um, that what's taken to be knowledge or justified belief or morality or whatever just depends upon what some local group takes to be knowledge or justified belief or morality. You don't have any sort of way of arguing that some group's set of beliefs is objectively mistaken. Whatever their beliefs are will depend upon their, their ideas about how to form beliefs and how to justify them, and they'll be right in their own terms. And we will be right in our own terms. And that's really all there is going to be to it. Now, the relativist with respect to knowledge, so the epistemic relativist, um, is going to say that knowledge varies, what's taken for knowledge varies between cultures, from one culture to another, from one time period to another. Uh, so let's just have an example of this. Take a claim that apparently was held at some point in the history of thought, namely that the earth is um, not round, and our own view that it is round, or more or less round, well, the relativist about knowledge is going to say that it's rational for us, right? We know that the earth is round. But in another time period, another context, another setting, it was rational for another people. They knew that the earth was flat. So one could know in one context, one culture, that the earth is flat, and we, in another context, under time period, know that the earth is not flat. We know the contrary. The relativist about knowledge is not just going to say that we believe that it's round and that this other group of people once believed that it was flat, but in fact they knew something stronger. They knew it was flat, and we know it's round. Right? And some people are going to think this gets you into a certain funny kind of position to be in. Now, we've just been talking about contextualism in the last lecture, and I think it's important to at least make some brief uh, remarks about the relationship between the relativist and the contextualist. Remember, the contextualist claim is that the word no is context-sensitive. So what you say using the word no in certain circumstances is different from what you say using the word no in certain other circumstances. In ordinary circumstances, when we use the word no to say, for example, here's a hand, here's another, and I know here's a hand, I know here's another hand, there are certain standards that apply in those circumstances, and they're lower than in other circumstances, but it's perfectly appropriate for say that we know something like here's a hand in a particular context. But we can shift the context by, for example, thinking about skepticism. Once we start thinking about skepticism, we've changed the standards that apply in the, con in the, in the conversation that we're having, the context in which we're discussing the, to discussing the topic. And in that context, it's no longer correct to say that we know that here's a hand and here's another, right? Standards shift, according to the contextualist, and we can go from high to low standards or from low to high standards. The question might be, is, there, is the contextualist saying something like what the relativist is saying? The contextualist is saying that standards for employing the word knowledge vary, depend upon context. The relativist seems to be saying something similar, but I think there's going to wind up being a difference. The contextualist, when they're talking about contexts, is typically talking about quite specific contexts of assertion or utterance. 
I say I know that the bank is open in certain circumstances, but then when the circumstances are um, different and it's really important that I be right, I no longer am able to say that I know that the bank is open. Even though the same degree of evidence is available to me. It was a, a shift in conversational context or setting in which one was asserting something that's relevant for the contextualist in saying whether or not the word no can be used appropriately in the context. By contrast with that, the relativist is talking about cultures or time periods, much broader things than actual specific context in which we speak. Also, the contextualist tends to talk about sort of lowering or high or, or increasing the standards. It's like working with the same set of standards but um, applying them with more rigor in certain contexts. That's different from the relativist for whom the standards can really be substantively different. I'm going to give you an example in, in a few moments, um, but the Azandi, uh, an African tribe, uh, have a particular way of working out what to believe about certain kind of phenomena, which is radically different from anything that we would be inclined to do. Um, so the standards, the word standard seems to be different with respect to relativism and contextualism. And the final contrast that I can see is that the contextualist doesn't have to deny that there exists a set of universal or objective standards. There could actually be a set of binding objective epistemic standards that applies to all of thought. And yet the contextualist could still run the line that it's appropriate to use the word no in certain contexts and not in a certain other context because they're not actually arguing about the status of fundamental standards of justification. They're talking about how the word no is sensitive to details of particular context. So there is some difference despite commonality, despite similarity between contextualism and relativism. Um, I'm actually, for purposes of today, being a little bit loose about whether I should be talking about knowledge or justified belief with respect to the relativist. The epistemic relativist is going to say that knowledge and justified belief are relative to some kind of context, culture of some kind. But in fact, if you bear in mind that knowledge requires truth, and justified belief doesn't require truth, the claim that knowledge is relative um, can be sort of more controversial than the claim that um, mere justified belief is relative. Because if you think that for knowledge to be relative, it's going to require that truth be relative, you're going to have to make sense of the idea that truth can be relative. And that's pretty much seemed to be an incoherent thought. The idea that somehow you can make truth a relative thing. Um, philosophers have tended not to take that too seriously. So I'm pretty much concentrating on the justification aspect of knowledge, putting to one side truth. So in talking about epistemic relativism, the idea is that justified belief can be relative and knowledge can be relative, but really only with respect to the justificatory component of knowledge. Now I want to say something about the relationship between skepticism and relativism. Positions are not always clearly distinguished. Um, they have something in common. Perhaps they have something like this second thought in common that the relativist and the skeptic are both going to, not, to deny that um, we have certain knowledge that's justified on the basis of a set of objective standards. Perhaps the relativist and the skeptic will both deny that. Um, but you'll, you'll get occasions where philosophers seem not to clearly distinguish these views. Even the classic skeptics like the Pironians sometimes have kind of relativistic seeming thoughts. For example, um, the discussion of the opposing perceptions that Sextus goes in for is sometimes characterized as the question of perceptual relativity. And you might think could be used to argue for relativism rather than skepticism. Also, Popper talks about a, um, the skeptical infinite regress as leading to relativism. But I think there's a clear way in which skepticism and relativism 
aren't the same thing. They're tending in opposite sort of directions. Um, the clear way to see this is to think of what they're going to say with respect to knowledge and justified belief. The skeptic is either going to deny that we have knowledge or suspend judgment with respect to whether we have knowledge. By contrast, the relativist is actually going to allow that we have knowledge or justify belief. They're not, they're not going to go with the skeptic and deny that we have knowledge. What the relativist will say is we have knowledge, but it's knowledge that's relative to some framework or context. We actually possess knowledge, but it's knowledge is just this variable thing that depends upon your context. The skeptic is not going to say that. The skeptic will either deny that we have knowledge or justify belief or just withhold judgment about that. So there is this contrast between the two positions. Now, the relativist claim, as I'm characterizing it, is that knowledge and justified belief vary with culture. Um, and there's no such thing as there being an objective knowledge or a set of standards that are invariant or absolute knowledge or anything like that. It's just a question of what we accept in a particular culture. And uh, internal to the culture, there will be something that we regard as knowledge. And there's no way in which you could uh, critically reject that in any way because all there is for, to knowledge is that particular people's groups accept certain claims to be knowledge or justify belief. But a claim like that really needs a little bit of detail to come to grips with. So I want to uh, talk for a while about an example. This is an anthropological example. Um, I'll be drawing on a book called Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic Among the Azandi. This is a classic anthropological text from around 1930-1940 by Evans Pritchard, and it, philosophers have quite liked this text. There's been a certain amount of philosophical literature discussing this, um, the things that Evans Pritchard says in reporting the Azandi. Um, and so the Azandi uh, are a group of people from Central Africa found um, in what we would in, in areas that we would now describe as being the Congo or the Sudan. Uh, the Azandi, of course, pre-existed those sort of modern um, divisions and states. Um, and what I want to get across with this example is that there can be quite radically differing sets of beliefs about the world and about how we ought to form and justify beliefs about the world. Um, the Azandi have some practices with respect to what they would presumably take to be knowledge, um, which are quite different from any that we employ. Now, having said that, and this is something I'm not even going to try to answer, <laughs> It's a question who we are, right? So the Azandi, I'm about to describe some practices that are going to seem somewhat alien to us, but who are we? Uh, and this is actually a problem for articulating relativism. It's something about different groups. So what are these groups? And are these groups kind of fully distinct or not? Um, so uh, am I speaking from the point of view of a Westerner, of a European, uh, from moder a modern as opposed to perhaps a primitive point of view? Is this a... Um, something that we say has Australians or as residents of Melbourne because we don't think anybody in Melbourne knows this kind of thing or as intellectuals. It's not sure what the contrast is. But I'm going to pretty much go along with the idea that what I'm about to describe is a set of practices quite unlike any that we uh, go in for. Now, um, there's two aspects to the case I want to just talk about. The first is that Evans Pritchard tries to show that the Azandi belief system involves an internal contradiction, but that they don't take this seriously. And the thought is, that's a bit weird. When you point out to them that their beliefs are internally self-contradictory, shouldn't they reject their beliefs or revise them? Well, apparently they don't. The second thing I want to look at is a particular ritual practice that the Azandi employed, I don't have no idea whether this is still done, Evans Pritchard was writing in the 30s, um, 
It's a the Azandi try to figure out the answer to certain kind of questions about what actually has happened or has caused some events. And they do so uh, using what um, Evans Pritchard calls a poison oracle. They administer some poison to chickens and then see what happens to the chickens. And depending on the outcome, they um, uh, adopt a particular answer. They accept a particular answer to the question they're trying to answer. Um, And I'm describing this because it seems to be an example of an epistemic norm, a standard of belief, of justification of belief, that's different from any that we possess. Though it's got parallels with lots of others, right? There are many things that it has in common. It has a kind of a procedure you go through to test some claim. So the background is that um, Evans Pritchard describes the Azandi beliefs about witchcraft. The word witchcraft is probably not perfectly correct as an English expression because um, Azandi witches aren't really like, say, European witches. Um, The Azandi appeal to their notion of witchcraft in order to explain various mishaps, various everyday misfortunes that occur. They try to explain how these events came about and the kind of things they can explain in terms of uh, the existence and, and act and action of a witch are people falling ill, perhaps even dying, uh, crops failing, or um, um, a hut catching fire, or an, an example is a um, uh, sort of a silo, where they, a small silo where they stored grain falling down. Right? These are particular events that are misfortunes, and they would try to explain why these things happened. Now, they often explain it in terms of the action of a witch, but witchcraft, this is one of the reasons why it's probably not really witchcraft in the sense in which we usually think of the term, Um, their witchcraft doesn't involve the use of any spells or rituals. The witchcraft, the action of witchcraft is, Evans Pritchard describes it as a psychic act. It's something that somehow happens uh, in a way that is mental in some respects. In the psychic act of witchcraft, there is something called mabismu mangu. I'm not sure if that's a correct pronunciation, which Evans Pritchard translates as the soul of witchcraft. This mabismu mangu leaves the witch's body. And it travels from the witch's body and goes and interferes with somebody else or does something. Um, and it's kind of localized. You, it's not like Mabismu Mongu can sort of go around the world. It, it, it typically is going to act on somebody in the same village because, or close by village because it can't actually go very far. But it's something that leaves the witch and goes and creates mischief. Now, if it's pretty hard, thinks that there's a kind of problem that arises internal to this belief system, and it has to do with this. Being a witch is inherited, and it's inherited uh, from father to son or mother to daughter. You can't go from father to daughter and can't go from mother to son. Right? So it's inherited from the parent of the same sex. There are some tests to determine whether witchcraft has uh, been present or uh, whether it's acted in any way. Um, You can do it to determine whether somebody is a witch. You can conduct a post-mortem. You can actually get inside. I think, I'm not sure he witnessed this, but you can do a sort of a a, um, open up somebody's insides and investigate, I guess it's one of the intestines, to see whether there's some substance there. He thought it, that what people were actually finding when they did this was undigested food, right? But they would look inside their guts to see whether there was some witchcraft substance. That you can do if, if the witch has died and you want to see whether they were a witch. But you're not going to be able to kill somebody to do it. You're, going to, you're trying to figure out whether a witch has brought about um, some unfortunate deed, some unfortunate event. Well, without conducting a an autopsy on somebody, what you can do is you can use the poison oracle. 
you give poison to a chicken, and depending on how it reacts, then you interpret the reaction of the chicken as indicating a yes or no answer to a question. You could have asked, my hut caught fire, was it brought about by the action of a witch? And if the chicken dies, you can interpret that as either yes or no, depending on how you set the things up. Um, but here's um, Evans Pritchard on the internal contradiction he detects in this set of beliefs. To our minds, it appears evident that if a man is proven a witch, the whole of his clan are ipso facto witches since the Zandi clan is a group of persons related biologically to one another through the male line. The Zandi see the sense of this argument, but they do not accept its conclusions, and it would involve the whole notion of witchcraft in contradiction were they to do so. The Zandi do not perceive the contradiction as we perceive it, because they have no theoretical interest in the subject. And those situations in which they express their beliefs in witchcraft do not force the problem upon them. Contradiction is presumably going to be that uh, something like everybody both is and is not a witch or something like that. Because given that you've found somebody to be a witch and they're all related, that would seem to show that everybody is a witch. Um, now, according to Evans Pritchard, the Azandi, when this is pointed out to them, don't show any sign of being concerned. Um, they don't try to revise their belief system, they don't have any way of sort of explaining it away, they don't, he says, take a theoretical interest in it. But Evans Pritchard thinks, well, there's something that's gone wrong here. Surely, when you point out an internal contradiction in your belief system, you should be taking this seriously. And so this sort of raises a um, question about how the Azandi think. And in the sort of early, late 19th and early 20th century anthropological theories of a sort of a philosophical nature, there was discussion about whether um, some of these so-called primitive peoples might have had what was called sort of a pre-logical mentality or whether they were just irrational. Um, well, philosopher Peter Winch objects to Evan Pritchard for, who for, uh, in a sense, tacitly criticizing the Azandi for not noticing that their belief system is incoherent. And Winch argues that, in fact, it's not the Azandi whose belief system has a, some kind of flaw, it's the anthropologist who pushes their beliefs where they wouldn't really go. So here's Winch. He says, the Azandi, when the possibility of this contradiction about the inheritance of witchcraft is pointed out to them, do not then come to regard their old beliefs about witchcraft as obsolete. They have no theoretical interest in the subject. This suggests strongly that the context from which the suggestion about the contradiction is made, the context of our scientific culture, is not on the same level as the context in which the beliefs about witchcraft operate. Zandi notions of witchcraft do not constitute a theoretical system in terms of which a Zandi tries to gain a quasi-scientific understanding of the world. This in turn suggests that it's the European obsessed with pressing Zandi thought where it would not naturally go to a contradiction who's guilty of misunderstanding, not the Zandi. So, the thought is that um, the Azandi, when presented with a way in which their set of beliefs about witchcraft seems to be internally contradictory or inconsistent, are not particularly interested in this. And um, seems to indicate that they don't actually think, in a sense, kind of logically about their beliefs. They don't, they're not prepared to tease out the implications of their beliefs and see how they come to some sort of logical, or, or identify the logical conclusions of their beliefs. Um, now this, at the very least, su suggests that the Azandi think differently from us. Um, they not only have different beliefs about the world, but maybe they even reason or think differently. Maybe they're just fundamentally set up differently when they, when they think about things. Um, now, this thought that a people could have an entirely different way of thinking from ours is kind of the thing, the sort of thing that a relativist is going to be 
suggesting. It's going to, it fits, going to fit well with the relativist. Now, um, you could perhaps take this in a more relativistic direction if you could come up with evidence not just that it looks like they think differently that they don't actually are, aren't too concerned about contradictions, maybe they reason somehow differently, but if you could actually come up with concrete examples of different standards or norms they use in justifying the beliefs, then this would further sort of support a relativist uh, idea. Um, and that's what I now want to uh, bring out with the um, with the use that the Azani make of the poison oracle. The Azandi had a test that they could employ independently of an autopsy to determine whether um, a witch has been active. Pr Evans Pritchard calls it the poison oracle. What they did is they would take a substance called bingi, and Evans Pritchard never really worked out exactly what it was. He was able to work out that it was a plant or it came from a root, um, but he was never able to really work out what the actual chemical um, agent in the poison was. And what you would then do is um, you'd administer the uh, poison to um, chickens and you would go through a ritual where you pose a set of questions and you then interpret how the chicken behaves uh, as an answer to those questions. Now, it's important that actually the poison oracle is not only used for witchcraft. They use it for all sorts of things. So if they're trying to figure out whether somebody had committed a crime, they could use the poison oracle. If they're trying to figure out um, how the weather's going to go, or maybe where to build their hut, right? then they can use the poison oracle. So it's not just used for detecting witchcraft. It's used for a certain amount of practical decision making. When you administer bingi to the chicken, the chicken can react in a number of different ways. It doesn't always react exactly the same way. It can die, but it can just go through spasms and survive. Um, it can uh, be unaffected and it can survive. So in advance it's not going to be known how the chicken is going to respond. So in a sense you're you, you know, that, that's not in control. And what you then do is you set up your questions beforehand and you say, if the chicken dies, that will mean yes or no, and so forth, right? Sometimes, where they really wanted to be careful, they would do this twice and reverse the order of the questions, right? So they would poison the chicken, see what happens, and then they would do it again in reverse order with questions reversed, just to make sure that they got it right the first time. So they could be quite careful in uh, employing this procedure. And in fact, it has a lot in common with lots of tests that you can think about, right? There's a ver they're quite explicit about what the qu what questions have to be asked and how the outcome is going to be interpreted, um, and there's a whole set of procedures you have to go through to make sure you've done this right. Seems clear from Evans Pritchard's description that the Azandi use the poison oracle as a basis for belief. They use it as a way of trying to figure out what has caused some unfortunate events. They use it to try to identify uh, those events in which a witch has brought about some unfortunate uh, event. And so it looks like the poison oracle constitutes a norm, a principle, a criterion or a standard which the Azandi use to justify their beliefs. So when they justify their beliefs about certain things, they're going to be able to point to having used the poison oracle and the outcome of the poison oracle will be that they should believe one way or the other about a particular state of affairs and it's the having used the poison oracle which will provide a justification for their belief. It looks like an epistemic norm, and it looks like a norm that's um, different from any that um, we possess. Now, if you're a relativist, what you're going to say is that the Azandi have a set of practices, a set of beliefs, a set of norms that work within their culture, 
They provide justification within the context of a Zandi culture. The Zandi arrive at claims to knowledge, which are justified internal to their belief system using the practices and norms they work with. There are different beliefs in different cultures, different norms and practices used in different cultures. There's no fact of the matter about whose norms and standards and procedures are correct. There's just different norms and procedures and practices used in different cultures. So the Azandi are perfectly right in their own terms to form their beliefs using the poison oracle and we, uh, you know, we're going to be right on our terms to use whatever procedures we use. There's just no kind of viewpoint from which you could say that one's right and the other's wrong and that's all there is to it. Now, here's quickly my take on this. Um, we don't have to accept that at all, right? I mean, that's quickly my take on it. We don't have to accept the idea that one set of norms is just as good as any other. Um, and why? Well, I think you can actually test these things, right? Or at least in principle, you could test the norms. Um, as Evans Pritchard describes the Zandi as being a quite practical people, so they're going to be interested in the empirical applicability of various things. Uh, so my proposal is that you simply test the norms. Um, take the poison oracle. Now we may not be able to test the reliability of the poison oracle with respect to witchcraft, but they use the poison oracle for not just witchcraft. They use it, for example, to determine who's done something where there's a question of a criminal act, like theft. Well, there's other ways to find out whether somebody committed a crime, like eyewitnesses and so forth. So we've got other ways of trying to work out whether somebody is guilty of a crime. So we could actually set up a test to try to work out whether the poison oracle is a reliable way of determining whether somebody committed a crime. We, right, we set up eyewitness testimony or whatever else and use that to see whether the actual um, uh, poison oracle works. Now, that may or may not be the uh, persuasive way of um, uh, attacking this problem, but um, um, it's something I've argued for in a paper of mine where what I've tried to do is suggest that we should be looking at norms and whether norms are good for the formation of justified belief by considering whether they're actually reliable. And reliability is something you can normally empirically uh, determine. You test to see whether your eyes are any good. Uh, and if they're any good, then they're reliable in leading you to have certain beliefs. And if your eyes aren't functioning well, then they won't be, right? This is something we can do empirically. If you're interested in this, um, it's a paper on my website called Witchcraft Relative and the problem of the criterion. Now, I don't want to dwell on that. I want to have a quick look at Karl Popper. Um, this is a slightly different take on relativism from what I've just been describing, um, but it does build on this issue of cultural difference, which does seem to be an important thing that the relativist picks up on. And um, Popper, and this is in a paper that's in the reader called The Myth of the Framework, emphasizes um, cultural conflict or difference between cultures in thinking about relativism. Popper's idea is that in different cultures, people work with different sets of assumptions. These assumptions can be quite deep, and he calls them frameworks. Um, and then the relativist position he describes is one according to which uh, in order for there to be communication between people, um, there has to be a sharing of assumptions. So those people with whom you're able to communicate well are basically people who are operating with the same set of assumptions as you do, uh, the same framework, but where you don't share a framework with, a, with another people, with a group of people, you're going to find real difficulties of um, communicating and the relative thought is that what it is to be justified, what it is to have knowledge, it's going to depend upon what framework you inhabit. Now, Popper, to a certain extent, sets this in linguistic terms, drawing on the ideas of Benjamin Lee Whorf, who proposed what was called the linguistic relativity hypothesis. He was a um, worked in the mid-20th century. 
was about to say that Worf is a linguist. Worf is actually, I think, a um, fire insurance investigator who uh, collaborated with a linguist named Sapir. So this is often called the sapir Worf hypothesis. Um, and Worf worked on a lot of American Indian languages. Um, so here's Popper. The myth of the framework can be stated in one sentence as follows. A rational and fruitful discussion is impossible unless the participants share a common framework of basic assumptions, or at least unless they have agreed on such a framework for the purpose of the discussion. Right, you've got to have a set of common assumptions in order to have a rational discussion. I mean by framework here, a set of basic assumptions or fundamental principles. That is to say, an intellectual framework. Although I contend that it's a most dangerous exaggeration to say that a fruitful discussion is impossible unless the participants share a common framework, I'm very ready to admit that a discussion among participants who do not share a common framework may be difficult. So he, he's going to oppose the myth of the framework. He doesn't think that sharing a framework is required for communication and rational discussion. But he does agree that it's difficult, it can be difficult to communicate and have a rational discussion with people who fundamentally disagree with you with respect to basic assumptions. Now, this is a different kind of where it's a different take on relativism from what I've just described. What I've just described is uh, epistemic relativism, where justified belief or knowledge depends upon a framework, and there's going to be different norms operating. That was the point of the Azandi example. Um, here he's talking about something similar, but he's pointing to this inability to communicate. According to the form of relativism that employs what Popper calls the myth of the framework, Communication between people um, is going to be impossible when you don't share a set of basic assumptions. Um, and uh, there's this idea that we're all sort of caught inside our frameworks. This is sometimes called the prison house of language. We've got a language that we work with that we use to describe the world. Other languages may do it quite differently, and we can't somehow get out of the set of meanings and way of presenting the world that's sort of encapsulated in our language. So here's Popper talking about Worf. Worf himself and some of his followers have suggested that we live in a kind of intellectual prison prison formed by the structural rules of our language. I'm prepared to accept this metaphor, though I have to add that it's an odd prison, as we're normally unaware of being imprisoned. We may become aware of it through culture clash, but then this very awareness allows us to break out of the prison. If we try hard enough, we can transcend our prison by studying the new language and by comparing it with our own. Admittedly, the result will be a new prison, but it'll be a much larger and wider prison. And again, we won't suffer from it. Or rather, whatever we do suffer from it, we're free to examine it critically and thus to break out again into a still wider prison. So he prepared to say that there are these frameworks and that um, the language may provide us with sets of meanings and assumptions that make it difficult to communicate. Um, but he doesn't think that we are forced into a relativist position. He thinks that somehow the clash between fundamentally different, different viewpoints, cultures, conceptual schemes, and so forth is quite important. Um, one thing it does is it makes us aware of our own assumptions. So the clash with other people's viewpoints makes us think about our own frameworks, makes us become conscious of our own frameworks. He doesn't think that it's impossible to communicate with people who have different frameworks. So if we're trying to communicate with the Azandi, as Evans Pritchard was, it wouldn't be impossible to communicate. It might be difficult, but it's not impossible. And Popper thinks it's actually worthwhile because it leads to benefits. <coughs> but um, he fundamentally doesn't think that there is this problem of being stuck inside our sort of mutually impenetrable languages and radically different frameworks incapable of understanding each other. He thinks, in fact, that um, what we should be doing is not sort of saying there's fundamental differences that can't be bridged, but rather 
We should try to communicate across the frameworks and we'll learn from doing so. Okay? So I wanted to, to get the popper in there so that you would see another take on the um, uh, relativist issue. If you're interested in reading the popper, it's in the reader. And right at the end, he makes some comments about the logical basis of relativism. Um, you'll notice that they have something to do with arguments you'll find in skepticism, in particular the problem of the criterion. Okay, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be back to sort of the topics that um, you get in Limos, though I'm going to be covering some material you don't necessarily find there. Um, but I'm going to talk about a priori knowledge, the possibility of a priori knowledge. You need to make a distinction between the a priori and the a posteriori. Uh, we'll look at a number of different ways in which people have approached this classic way of thinking about things that we can know analytic necessary truths a priori and contingent um, synthetic truths we know a posteriori I mentioned something from Kant's idea that we can know some synthetic claims about the world a priori I mentioned a bit of, about Kripke and then uh, ask uh, well consider the proposal that there is no a priori. There's actually a kind of a strong tradition in trying to show that there is no such thing as any a priori knowledge. Look at that tomorrow. Okay, have a bit of time for questions and if you haven't already given me your essay there. Yeah. It's not really as binary as all this, is it? Because, I mean, there would be... It, it's really questions about knowing some things or some aspects to which the relativist takes issue. I mean, the, you know, if you were going to, to ask the Zandi how to, build up, to, how to build a house, they would take account of the same things that, you, that, that other people would take account of. So the relativism only applies to particular types of knowledge in certain areas some of which won't be recognized in other cultures at all, yep. and others of which will be, you know, the relative, if you take the relativism of how one organizes a criminal trial between Britain or Italy or, you know, Russia or China, yep. uh, there are going to be quite large degrees of, of variance in those things anyway. So, and that last point is interesting because Evans Pritchard reports that the Azandi um, who were living in a British colony at the time much preferred to use the poison oracle than to use the British courts. Um, they, 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 they were more confident in the poison oracle than they were in, in the courts. Um, but, but that is an important point that, that, the, that there looks like there's going to be some commonality between cultures because they, people pretty much have to do the same thing. Um, and it, the relativist is going to have to show that there is that things aren't so radically disparate. Um, question is, you know, is that going to be a problem for relativism or is that something they can build into it, into their view? Other thoughts? Nick? You kind of went into this on your paper, but how does the Italian example give a case for extended relativism because it seems to say nothing about church? Okay, right. So I'm, I'm thinking about epistemic relativism as being relativism about justified belief rather than relativism about knowledge where that includes truth. Um, and I, you can have a relativism about justified belief that isn't a relativism about truth. Uh, I wasn't trying to talk about relativism about truth, nor was I trying to talk about relativism about knowledge where that included truth. Um, and the reason for that is that um, to come up with a... Um, sort of coherent conception of truth relativism is um, a harder job, I think, than to come up with an idea, than to assert that justification could be um, relative. Because, I mean, traditionally it seemed like there's something incoherent about the idea that truth is relative. And it's, once you distinguish relativism from, of justification from relativism about truth, it's not so obvious that you have a, an obvious incoherent position. You might have a mistaken position, but not one that you can show is so obviously internally incoherent. So, in talking about relativism about knowledge, I'm focusing on the justificatory aspect rather than the truth aspect. Other questions? Okay, toots tomorrow, and lecture on the a priori. Bye.
Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tim. Don't worry about it. Okay. I think you're okay. Yeah, no, I responded to you. Okay. Yeah, okay. your your um essay is on the LMS site. It is. Yeah, I think the I think LMS was really misbehaving for the first half of the day. Yeah. So I so yeah, I, th- I think. Submitted it last night and I it wasn't like uh, I got it through the first time and then when I went to check this morning. Well, it wasn't up, and I couldn't get to the LMS. Yeah. Throughout the morning, I, I, I could almost not even get into the LMS yeah. to, to, to upload the lecture. Yeah, it's really weird, especially on my computer. I have to now submit everything at the library when oh, I right. get to the LMS, so huh. it's really weird. Well, yeah. So you said it's submitted now? It's, it's, it's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your, your essay is there. Your essay okay. was, was there when... Well, when I checked. Okay. Right. <laughs> did you give me a hard copy? Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, right. excellent. Yeah. Right, Hello. Just a question about the skeptics. How would they view um, um, like math concepts and uh, logical truth or logics? Um, so then you could have. Um, I mean, a, a skeptic, a skeptic across the board will suspend judgment about everything, right? They'll, they'll sus- if it's a Caronian skeptic, they'll just suspend judgment about everything. Because well, in, in this law, you just uh, of saying that um, there's no objective truth. Oh, so this is relativism. Um, but so, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, skeptics and what yeah, as well. and they are, they're sort of opposing each other. You you could have um, a relativist who. Um, you, you could have sort of a, I mean, a relativist, a full, full-blown relativist is going to say that everything is relative to the framework. Um, you know, and that would include logic and, and mathematics. But you could also imagine somebody having a restricted view. Um, yeah, but with relatives, maybe it's um, more plausible to me. Right. Yeah. But with skeptics that I can't, I can't get, how would they deny there is no... Um, Objective truth. Well, the, if if they have an argument for it, can they argue uh, against math and against logic? Um. Well, I, so Would think about think right? about how the problem of criterion works with the justification. They just ask you you, you try to prove something in mathematics. You're going to make some assumptions. They'll ask for your justification. You'll appeal to something else. They'll ask for your justification. They'll say there's an infinite regress here. And then they'll say, okay. So they'll just suspend judgment. Mm-hmm. I mean, they could run the regress argument. Yeah. Since proof has to start from, any mathematical proof starts with assumptions. The question is, where do the assumptions come from? Mm-hmm. How are they known? How are they justified? I'm just like talking about something like square is square. Or something corresponds to um, external life. You know? Yeah. Reality. Yeah, so the skeptic's going to... Um, so would they deny that that's not a square? Would they say that's not a square? Or that's your, your own... D- depending, on the, depending, or depending on the skeptic, I mean, if it's the, what I call a moderate one, they're just going to suspend judgment. Mm. They just, they, they just, they're not going to commit. They're going to say, look, I've got no reason to believe one way or the other. They'll say, look, everybody seems to... But believe. he doesn't believe in not believing. Well, they try not to even have that. They, it's, it, they try not to have any beliefs. Mm. And they try not to even have a belief about that. They just try to not have beliefs. Cause, and they're, they're forced in that situation because they, of the arguments they give. Mm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so interesting, but... Uh, I think a lot of people, a, a lot of people are going to, a lot of people... Justification. A, well, a lot of people are going to think you can't take skepticism too seriously. Um, uh, I mean that's so most philosophers want uh, like would you point to a figure in a skeptic figure just uh, re- uh, more in, in no contemporary, contemporary skeptics oh I, there's a guy in New York named Unger who I, I think is a is a skeptic um, okay um but you know, it's only one person. We're not sure about the name either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, typically people try to combat skepticism rather than endorse it. Um, 
it's 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 usually sort of seen, it's kind of a figure. It's a it's a and you're, you're trying to figure out how to respond to the skeptic. That's kind of the puzzle. Epistemology. How, how do you show that there's something wrong with skepticism? How can you how do you refute the skeptic? Um, doesn't mean anybody actually is a skeptic. That's not, and the same thing with relativism. You, you, you do find people who say relativistic things, but you rarely find somebody who endorses the relativist position. Relativism is more um, also 